I want to share some thoughts with you this morning on how I believe data can make the supply chain more sustainable. No business is an island. Businesses are interdependent and have to rely on each other. Key customers and key suppliers are critical to the success of our businesses. We need customers who consistently and regularly buy from us. We need suppliers on whom we can depend and rely to have the goods or services we need when we need them. So it's really important that we know those customers and suppliers. And I don't just mean knowing whether or not they're a limited company or a sole trader and, uh, and where the registered office is. We need to know more than that. We need to know about the, our supply chain up and down and their supply chain up and down as well. We need to know what their long-term plans are. Are they always going to be producing the product or service that we need? Are they changing direction of what they're doing? Are they changing the, 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 the contents of what they do and might it affect us? What's their capacity for meeting our demand if they're going to grow in a different direction and focus on different products or services? And we need to know our customers' customers or our suppliers' customers. Most of you won't remember some of us are old enough to remember Woolworths going bust in 2008. It was no great surprise the collapse of Woolworths had been forecasted and heralded for a long time. I talked to many suppliers of Woolworths at that time and most of them had been actively working to reduce the amount of money they were owed, to reduce the amount of stock that was held so that they could minimise their loss when eventually the uh, curtain came down. The people that caught a cold when Woolworths went down were primarily the suppliers to the suppliers of Woolworths because some of them didn't even know that their products were ending up on Woolworths shelves. They only found out that linkage when their, supply, their customer couldn't pay them because Woolworths had collapsed and couldn't pay. And similarly in 2018 when Carillion went into insolvency. I talked to stacks of small, tiny contractors who went bust as a result of Carillion's collapse. Many of those didn't even realise that Carillion was at the top of the chain. They were a roofer doing some work on a building site in Reading for a contractor they worked for, had no idea that further up the chain there was a Carillion. And they only found out when their employing contractor couldn't pay them because up the chain, the contractor hadn't received funds from Carillion. So it's really important that we know our key customers and their customers and their suppliers and so on. And we need to look horizontally as well as vertically up and down the supply chain. What's going on in the world that could affect our ability to be supplied or if it's a customer to be paid? We need to look across the sector, across the industry, across the comp comp competitive landscape. A year ago, if you were taking on a supplier and they were sourcing some of their products from Ukraine or Russia, you probably wouldn't have given it a second thought. Today, I suspect you would. You may have read last week in the press that a company called Cellular Goods announced that it was falling way short of its sales targets. Its new chief exec, Anna Chikina, said they were having to overhaul their entire marketing strategy from top to bottom. Cellular Goods is a business that um, manufactures and sells um, toiletries and cosmetics that are cannabis-based. David Beckham has a 10% stake, and that what got it a bit of a name when it was first launched. Why are its sales falling so far short? They're falling short because Google, Instagram and Facebook won't carry ads for cannabis-based products. 
cellular goods whole marketing strategy was based on the premise that they would sell through those channels. If you were buying from or selling to cellular goods a year ago when they were sharing their incredibly um, ambitious sell forecasts, I wonder if you'd have thought about the marketing policy and strategy of Google, Instagram and Facebook. I make no apology this morning that I will frequently interchange the words supplier and customer. And I'll do that because well, I'll tell you my background in a minute, which will explain it. But for me, the principles are exactly the same. Whether you're buying or selling, you need to do good due diligence. You need to know the key people in the business. You need to keep accurate and proper records so you can look back and see what's happened and what's been agreed. And it's worth looking at the director's personal financial history because people that are profligate tend to run businesses in which they're profligate and that can cause a problem of itself. My name is Philip King. I've been working in credit management for about 42 years. I spent uh, a number of years working for an electrical wholesaler and then um, a computer manufacturer. Then I spent 10 years at Vodafone um, in various credit management roles before becoming the chief exec of Charter, the Chartered Institute of Credit Management, where I worked with credit professionals around the world who were managing risk, amongst other things, um, and also worked with government um, and, and businesses of all sizes. At the end of 2019, I was asked by government if I would step in for six months as the Small Business Commissioner on an interim basis while they recruited um, a new permanent commissioner. I agreed to do that and six months became 17 months because of COVID um, and I finally gave up that post in the middle of last year. During my time as Small Business Commissioner, I talked to hundreds of small businesses and I talked to stacks of procurement directors of large businesses when we were talking about the importance of cash flow for small businesses. I'm passionate about all things small business. I'm passionate about the importance of good credit management and I'm passionate about the importance of cash flow for businesses of all sizes because when businesses run out of cash, they fail. I'm now working with a number of businesses, one of which is Company Watch for whom I'm speaking this morning and all of those businesses support my passion for things that are cash flow and business related. The strength of a supply chain is determined by the weakest link in that chain. Ensuring suppliers are sustainable is a win-win. It's important for them, obviously, and it's important for us as customers and buyers. And we make them sustainable by doing a number of things. One is paying them on time. When we pay a supplier on time, we help their cash flow. We make sure they've got money in the bank when they need it. We keep our side of the deal. If we've asked someone to deliver goods next Wednesday, we expect them to deliver them next Wednesday. Why shouldn't they expect us to pay on time for what they've delivered in good faith? It's just the other side of the bargain. When we pay suppliers on time, we remove the distraction that is there from non-payment. So they can worry about things they're good at, whether that's web design or roofing or plumbing or whatever it might be, they can concentrate on what they're good, on, good at without being distracted. When they've got the cash flow they need, they can invest in people, in skills, in research and development, in growing their business so that we all benefit. And often understated, when we pay suppliers on time, we support their mental health. I talked to stacks of small business owners when I was small business commissioner who shared harrowing stories of sleep disorder, um, relationship breakdowns, mood swings, eating disorders, as a result of not being able to sleep at night because they were worried whether or not a customer was going to pay them. If they'd got to pay the wages of their small team on Friday, or pay the rent, 
or pay a key supplier, that payment not arriving was massive for them and was really important. And when you pay on time, you become a preferred customer. I've known a guy called, uh, known a guy called Rob for about 30 years. Rob runs a property management business from Wakefield in Yorkshire. And predominantly, he, he goes in and restores and, and, and um, recovers the damage to properties when there are floods and such like. Rob doesn't have many staff. He employs subcontractors around the country. And when he takes on a new contractor, he has a conversation with them, which goes along the lines of, I will always pay your invoices on time. You have my word, I guarantee it. In return, I want to be your number one customer. When I ring you at half past eight on a Sunday night, because there's a leaking pipe in Meadowhall Shopping Centre, I want you in there fixing it. I want you in there fixing it for me and before you do any work for anybody else that might be calling you that night. And I want your best team working on that job because my reputation depends on how good a job you do. I want to be your number one customer. And when you pay on time, you enhance your reputation. Many of the credit reference agencies report payment behavior. If you pay well, that impinges on your credit score. Large businesses have to report twice a year on the government payment practices reporting portal. That's visible to anybody that wants to look. Paying well is important. And collaborating with suppliers as partners isn't always the way we do business. Sometimes people think that suppliers should just be screwed for the best price we can get. They're seen as a commodity. But that shouldn't be the case. They should be partners. We should be working with them as partners. The ESG agenda is gaining some real momentum, primarily around the environment and net zero and so on, quite rightly. But the S of ESG, the social, is around being good corporate citizens. Good corporate citizens will pay their suppliers on time. Failed businesses undermine the economy, they undermine the social agenda, they undermine employment and everything else. So paying on time is really important. And it's not just about payment, it's about seeing them as partners. When the lockdown was announced in March 2020, I talked to Pete Redfern, who was then and still is chief exec of Taylor Wimpy, although he's shortly moving on. Pete recognised that early in the lockdown, many of his smallest contractors that had worked for Taylor Wimpy for many years were going to be struggling. He did three things. He got his divisional managers to ring every small contractor to reassure them that payment would be coming out for any outstanding invoices on time and they didn't need to worry. But he went a step further. He arranged to pay those contractors forward for business they had yet, for work they had yet to do. So they got paid in advance for work they'd started but hadn't yet finished. He wanted them still in business when the lockdown was lifted. He wanted them back on site as soon as he could get them. And so that was his way of trying to make that happen. And he recognised that many of the smallest contractors would be struggling with their well-being and mental health as a result of lockdown and so on. And so he took the, the web-based tools that he had for his, his team, his employees, and he opened that up to all his smallest contractors so they had access to web tools to support them. In 2017, I had a conversation with the procurement director of one of the biggest fast food organisations in the country. I'll call her Susan for the benefit of uh, anonymity this morning. Most of that organization's key suppliers had been suppliers for more than 10 years. Their policy was when, when they found a good supplier that was reliable, delivered good product on time, and they had a good relationship with, they kept them, even if they had to pay a premium for doing so. They had a three-pillar approach. They worked to maximize profit for the company, for the suppliers, and for the franchisees. Susan told me a story about the, the, the year before when she'd rung a potato farmer in Lincolnshire. 
there had been some massive floods across the UK and many farms were struggling. They were underwater and they were struggling. She rang this farmer and said, how's it going? He told her a tale of woe. Half his potatoes had been lost. Several of the fields were underwater. He couldn't get around the farm. Everything was an absolute nightmare. But, he said, don't worry. Your shipments are going to arrive on time, no problem, and they're going to be fine. And Susan was really, was really pleased, and she said, well, that's fantastic news, because I thought we were in a position where we were going to have to be working out how we'd source from elsewhere. He said, no, 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 we're shipping to you when we said we would. And she said, well, you know, how are you doing that? If you've only got half the crops left, how can you do that? He said, we can do that because we're going to prioritise shipments to you above other customers. And she said, well, that's, <laughs> that's really good news. Thank you so much. But why? You, he said, are the only customer that's rung to find out how things are. When we do the right thing, when we work in partnership, we build relationships that are more than just transactional. Data is invaluable, but not all data is equal. You will know, as I do, that Companies House is a very large filing cabinet. People file information when they're meant to file it into the cabinet, and other people come along, take it out, and read it and use it. As a result, there are all sorts of mismatched director records. Directors get given IDs which are numerous and don't get pulled together. And a few years ago, I was working um, for an organization and we lobbied Companies House to say to them that we were very uncomfortable that people were thinking, because it was a government website, they could rely on what they downloaded. And we know that's not necessarily the case. <clears throat> and if you look at the Companies House website beta site now where you download documents, you'll see a small link at the top that says Companies House does not verify the accuracy of the information filed. I wanted a sort of all jumping, all dancing, neon flashing lights thing. I got size 10 Helvetica blueprint at the top. <clears throat> but at least we got Louise Smythe to agree to do that. The Economic Crime Bill, which is in the news this morning because of the uh, changes to overseas um, property ownership and so on, includes or was planned to include measures to su support and strengthen Companies House. They're talking about a white paper being issued shortly, but we're not quite sure where it's going. That will introduce director ID verification if the proposals go through. It'll increase the power of the registrar to check, reject and remove information and it will be aimed to improve the quality and value of financial information on the register. But we're way away from that just yet. <clears throat> if you're looking at accounts that are pre-COVID, frankly, we're wasting our time because the world has changed so much. Balance sheets look no, no, completely different now from what they would have looked pre-COVID. And even in best case, we're looking at information that's six months out of date for public companies and nine months for private companies. So the information we look at from Companies House is always inherently out of date. I'm working with Company Watch because I believe their system is really good. I'm going to talk about that for the next few minutes. But my plea to you this morning is look at whatever sophisticated tools are available. Don't be um, conned into thinking Company Watch is the only one that works. There's lots of them out there. I happen to think it's the best, but that's for you to make a call on. But uh, the monitoring alert system enables you to monitor businesses for things from alternative sources from just the official ones. So pulling data from all sorts of sources, you can get customizable alerts for your portfolio, for an individual business um, or whatever, <coughs> multiple frequency, daily, weekly, monthly, whatever you want, looking at a whole range of different things. Because I'm working with Company Watch, I've set my own portfolio up and I've got my kids' employers on there.
just out of interest. And I got an email this morning telling me that my son's employer had suffered a distressed debtor. So somebody that they have sold to was listed on a statement of affairs in an insolvency recently. As it happens, it's 1,600 quid and his employer is um, multi-million. So it probably won't change their or his world. But imagine if it had been a two million pound bad debt, how important it would have been to know that. And very often, in the, in, in the example of Carillion, many contractors simply went bust because the one above them couldn't pay. If you know that the, the supplier above you or the customer above you hasn't been paid, then you know there's a risk you're not going to be paid or you're not going to be continued to supply. Picking up information early is a real benefit. Elite Legacy Education Limited was reported on the Company Watch system as having a winding up petition presented in September 2020 and going into liquidation in December 2020. If you monitored that on Company's House, you would have found out about the winding up petition three months later in December 2020 and about the liquidation a full month later in January 2021. Seeing things quickly, reacting to them quickly is really important. Beaumont Morgan Developments Limited, there was an appointment of an administrator advertised in the Gazette on the 25th of January this year. On the 21st of December last year, Company Watch reported the notice of intention to appoint administrator. Seeing that information a month earlier is really important. The Company Watch searched functionality takes the documents, the PDFs the company, company's house produces, using optical character recognition, it looks into those things and you can search on them. So you can search across the entire population or your portfolio or a company for words like raw material price increases, foreign currency exposure, director's loans, energy price impact, and things like that. And not only does it look at the accounts, but it also looks at the post balance sheet notes. And I don't know about you, but in all my time working in credit management and risk management, I've always focused on the numbers. And I've always known the words are important, but the numbers have always been the key thing that I've looked at. Having a system that can look at the words for you and identify key words is really useful. In the light of the Greensill debacle last year, supply chain finance might have been an interesting phrase to search for. It's not always apparent in the numbers, but it has to be declared in the notes. So it's a way to find out. And if you search for C-bills or B-bills or furlough, you'd find information about what support businesses had taken on from government. And the system produces three scores. It's H score, which is well known and well recognized for measuring how closely the numbers match businesses that have previously failed. Looks at all the data. There's no guarantee that a business that hits the warning level is gonna fail. What I can tell you is that most businesses that fail were in the warning level. So there's a reason to look at them. And the eighth score system has been recently developed so that you can now play games with it. You can experiment. So you can take the reported information and you can say, what if raw materials costs went up by 50%? What if energy prices went up by 30%. What if sales dropped by 50% or grew by 20%? And you can see what that does to the score and see what the impact would be. Going back to my cellular goods story, if we know that their marketing isn't working as they thought, what if their sales are 50% less than anticipated? And not only can you play around with the numbers of companies that are on there, you can create your own companies. So if you've got a small supplier and you don't have listed information on which loads of analysis are carried out, 
but you do get management accounts, you can create a company, put those management account numbers in, and then see what the score would be and benchmark it against companies that have more information and better scores to look at. You can look into the future based on what you think might happen. And being able to compare one supplier with another can be really valuable. The second score is the text score. The text score takes the functionality that I talked about in searched. Using machine learning, it measures the frequency of particular words or phrases compared to companies that ultimately became insolvent. <clears throat> it makes no judgment about whether those, good, those words are good or bad. It just picks them up and reports on them and allocates a score based on what it sees. Pound Stretcher went into a creditors voluntary arrangement in June 2020. TechScore picked up the use of the word provisions far more than the normal and related to previous failures. Terms like onerous lease provision, dilapidation provision appeared frequently and regularly in the numbers. Onerous leases were at the root of the problems that led to the CVA in June 2020. And the third score is a combined score that pulls together the H score and the text scoring. You can look and you can see where a company sits in the hierarchy of businesses within a group. And Aphrodite is an enhanced system of director name matching and searching. I said earlier that the company's house allocates IDs to directors and there are numerous mismatches and so on. <clears throat> if you searched for Dominic Joseph Andrew Chappelle, he of BHS fame, the serial bankrupt who paid a pound for BHS just under a year after, just over a year later, it collapsed. He was disqualified for 10 years in November 2019. <clears throat> Companies House shows that disqualification against one of his previous directorships. It doesn't against any of the others. What Company Watch Aphrodite system does is look at all the information about an individual. You can search for them, you look at them, and it gives you a probability of a, of a match. If it's 100%, Company's House has picked it up. If it's 90%, lots of other things have picked up, and it's very likely it's the same person. Having the ability to look at someone who's involved in a business you're going to get involved with to see what else they're involved in can be really useful, and it can give you a really good and full picture of what's available. <clears throat> I was going to ask you to visit the company watch stand and talk to the guys there to learn more about the system. But you don't even need to do that. You don't need to talk to anybody. Just walk past the stand casually with your phone in your hand, scan the QR code, and you will get the full interactive brochure downloaded to your phone in a second. And on your way past, you can grab a lint chocolate ball as well. Simple steps make a difference. I often talk to credit risk professionals about the importance of meeting key customers, looking them in the eye when you're asking questions, seeing how they look, deciding whether or not you can trust them with money that you're going to invest in them in the form of supplies on credit. And that's no different from suppliers. Sadly, looking people in the eye over the last couple of years has been mainly into a laptop screen, which isn't quite the same because body language doesn't quite work the same way. Would you trust someone that was wearing pajamas under the screen and a shirt and tie above? Now, thankfully, we are in a position where we can get out and meet people, and that's important. But you know, if you look at a balance sheet and the stock looks really healthy, that's an encouraging sign. But it's only when you walk through the warehouse and see how thick the dust is on the boxes of, of stock that you find out what its true value is. 
You can't do that online. You can't do that by email exchange. You can only do that by being present and looking. When a business tells you that it's massively busy, you can only see that when you stand there for a couple of hours and watch what's going on. And get management accounts. Management accounts are internal documents. They are of questionable value, but A, you can plug them into the experimentation system, so you can use them to um, produce and update scores and so on. B, you can look at trends over time and see what happens to the business. I think one or two of A and B. I think I said one and two, didn't I? Anyway, three or C, whichever one it is. Um, you can look at them and compare them to reported numbers that are in the audited accounts and see how close they are. And that gives you an indication of the level of margin of error. Three takeaways from me this morning. Really know your key partners. And don't just leave it to chance or luck. Have a process and policy to make sure that the data is captured early on so you always get the same information and have a, a, a background to businesses that you need. Look, listen, and delve. One of the uh, things I share with credit people is the ABC of good risk assessment. I didn't make this up, I pinched it from somebody else. But accept nothing, believe nobody, challenge everything. If you do that, you get beneath the surface and you under what, understand what's going on. And the final takeaway is a really, really simple one. Capture a unique identifier. It seems so obvious. If it's a UK business, get the company registration number from day one. If it's an overseas company, get the equivalent. So many businesses don't do that. If you rely on the name, it's no guarantee that you'll be looking at apples and apples in five years' time. Having a registration number means you've got a unique identifier that you can always use, and it makes it so much more precise when you're searching and looking. All I'll say to you this morning is use the tools that are available. As buyers and customers, we need continuity of supply. The more we know, the more confident we can be about the suppliers we work with. And there are tools available now that enable us to manage risk easily and effectively. And you are in a very privileged position. When I started life in credit management, um, looking at risk assessment, I used to work with a row of Dun & Bradstreet registers on the windowsill. Anybody rem remember Dun & Bradstreet registers? I just, I just know how old I am now. Well, they were a set of books that got updated annually. They had a credit score for all companies. Um, and then you got quarterly or monthly updates where you could go in and you could change the, the, the rating against companies. Um, and that was credit risk assessment. They were the tools available to enable us to manage risk. What I've showed you this morning and talked to you about this morning is light years away from that. Go and scan the QR code, grab a lint chocolate ball, and uh, find out how you can know better your suppliers. Thank you for your time this morning. Any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Any questions about the system, Mike Newman at the back there will be very happy to answer them because he knows it better than I do. Um, but any questions, please fire them at me. No questions? In that case, thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you.